Imagine for a moment, if you will, that there was a way to turn back the clock and experience Final Fantasy VII again for the very first time. What made it so good in the first place? A world full of strange, minute, unexplained details that we have no choice as the player but to accept? A massive, layered story? Weird nuances like guns, swords, and mechs, and magic all simultaneously existing in the same world? Did we enjoy it so much because it's a wonderful mess full of contradictions and oddities left unexplained? Well, I have stumbled upon an old and forgotten title from the same era that most people overlooked. A game that's just as messy and beautiful and full of wonder as its proverbial older brother. A game that will give you the closest chance of feeling what it felt like to play your favorite childhood JRPG for the first time all over again. That game is Saga Frontier 1 on the Sony PlayStation. Developed by Squaresoft's production team 2, Saga Frontier was released in North America on March 25, 1998 on the Sony PlayStation 1. Saga Frontier is actually the seventh game in the Saga franchise, beginning with what was known in North America as Final Fantasy Legends 1, 2, and 3 on the Nintendo Game Boy. Then came the fourth, fifth, and sixth entries known as Romancing Saga 1, 2, and 3 that were only released in Japan. The Saga franchise would later return to North America and receive its 7th and 8th entries titled Saga Frontier 1 and Saga Frontier 2. Another installment into the franchise would come in 2003 with Unlimited Saga for the PlayStation 2. So far, to this day, the franchise has yet to receive another proper entry outside of a remake of the Super Famicom game Romancing Saga 1. There has, however, been a recent release of a mobile game titled Saga Re-Universe, which has proven to be a fairly popular game. Production was led by Akatoshi Kawazu, who was involved in the development of Final Fantasy 1 and 2. One of the hallmark features of Final Fantasy 2 was its activity-based development system, a system in which you become better at the actions you perform, like wielding a sword or a bow and arrow, or casting magic, for example. This feature was later abandoned, but it's one of the core mechanics of the Saga Frontier franchise. So what is Saga Frontier? Saga Frontier is a collection of seven short stories following seven characters from all walks of life. Each of these character stories is unique, with each making cameos in each other's storylines, while also at times being recruitable party members. That being said, there is no giant overarching plot that ties all of these characters together in any kind of grand scheme or plot. There's Red, a young man whose father was killed by a notorious crime syndicate. Red confronts his father's murderer despite being hopelessly outgunned, and at the last minute is saved by a masked superhero who then takes Red under his wing and gives him a new identity known as Alkaiser. Then you have Acellus, a schoolgirl who's mortally wounded in a horrific accident involving a group of beings known as mystics. Mystics are humans with the natural born ability to perform magic. They save her life and take her back to their homeland and nurse her back to health. She later awakens at Chateau Aguil, a gothic-themed castle of roses and thorns, now a prisoner. Up next, there's T69420, an ancient robot discovered in a heaping pile of scrap by a young boy and his sister. He becomes part of their family, dealing scrap to put food on the table before his memory activates and he says his goodbyes to his new family and sets off on a quest to finish his mission that he started thousands of years ago. You also have Amelia. She's an ex-supermodel turned cop who's framed for her soon-to-be husband's death. She's stripped of her badge and imprisoned. There, she makes friends with a few prisoners that are part of an underground resistance movement trying to put an end to a military group known as Trinity, who Amelia suspects has something to do with her fiancé's death. You also can't forget about Ricky, the monster boy from a world known as Margmel, who sets out on a journey to collect seven rings that together have the power to save his homeworld. He meets a friend along the way that's slowly corrupted by the rings. Ricky must make a choice, save his home or save his friend. Lastly, there's a magician named Blue who sets out on a journey to learn magic from every region before facing down his twin brother in a fight to the death. A cruel mission, but a necessary one for the future of the Magic Kingdom. I almost forgot about Loot. Loot had about 90% of his story cut due to time and budget constraints. Nobody likes Loot. He dies really, really easily. Loot is actually so bad that he's the only main character in Saga Frontier that can actually be removed from your main party. You can actually play Loot's story and not even use Loot at all. Loot is a ne'er-do-well, irresponsible ladies' man who goofs his way into overthrowing an empire. Just to find out, he's actually the heir to their throne. When beginning a playthrough of Saga Frontier, you're free to choose any one of these characters to start playing as. The choice is truly yours to make. There are no side effects to who you choose to play as first. There's absolutely no penalty or changes made to each character's story based on the order in which you complete each scenario. 
That being said, I do encourage you to play as Red first. His scenario is pretty straightforward and linear, with a heavy emphasis on story content. Some characters like Loot and Blue have more of an open world feel, and the game does not guide you or hold your hand much at all. Even then, the more linear scenarios still give you chances to go off and explore the many regions in the game's world and complete side quests at your leisure. Typically, at the start of each scenario, your character is alone and you have to venture out and make friends and recruit additional party members. There are a handful of recurring recruitable characters, each with their own reasons for joining you on your journey, and most of these characters can be recruited in each scenario. However, there are a few unique recruitable characters that can only be attained in certain storylines, so be sure to explore. Combat in Saga Frontier is honestly a lot of fun. Monsters appear on the screen and chase you, hide from you, and even ambush you, which is always exciting. There are almost always sub-bosses in each dungeon that can totally mop the floor with you if you're not prepared for a tough fight. There are also even a handful of hidden optional super-bosses if you're up for a real challenge. The game allows you up to 5 characters to take into battle, and you can actually recruit enough characters to form multiple parties that you can swap in and out before a battle begins. And by doing so, the characters in your other party can actually gain back WP the points you utilize to perform different combat techniques during battle. Saga Frontier allows for a huge amount of customization. You're able to fight with your bare hands, swords, katanas, guns, as well as magic. Much like Final Fantasy II, whatever weapon you're using on a character, they become better with that weapon, and they'll eventually learn skills as time goes on. Some characters you recruit onto your team are implied to be a user of a specific type of weapon, like Gen, the washed up drunken samurai from Wakatu. However, you can still equip Gen with guns rather than swords and train him as a marksman. Likewise, you could also focus on training him with magic, or anything else for that matter. The most satisfying thing about Saga Frontier's combat system is the fact that characters can learn new weapon techniques in almost any moment, which can sometimes be the difference in winning or losing a fight. Some techniques are area of effect attacks, some target all enemies on the field, while others are just devastating finishing moves that only target one foe. That being said though, there is however a very few special techniques like the Dream Saver combo that only a few characters can learn through fighting barehanded. The Dream Saver combo can take almost an entire playthrough to obtain, but it is absolutely crucial to taking on some of the game's optional super bosses. As you press forward into the game, your characters that have fought alongside each other for long enough will begin to attack together, stringing different weapon techniques and spells to form combos, which deal a massive amount of damage. Some of these combos' visuals are absolutely insane and could potentially cause a seizure. Also, be wary of headphones. A level 4 bolt thrower combo could probably rupture your eardrums. There's also another very unique feature in Saga Frontier, and that's the life points system. Each character has a finite number of life points, and when they reach zero, that character is permanently no longer able to fight until you return to a region that has an inn. The weird little shack in Kurong that looks kinda like an opium den, that was my go-to place, so it also works. Typically, when the character you're playing as has their life points dropped to zero, it's game over. Some monsters even have abilities that attack your life points directly, so be warned. This feature, along with Saga Frontier being fairly open world, can actually cause you to save yourself into a corner and make it impossible to progress in the game, due to not having enough heals or characters able to fight. It's always important in Saga Frontier to prepare before embarking on a side quest or journeying deep into certain dungeons. If you enter a place and the monsters feel ridiculously powerful, turn back, trust me. Saga Frontier will not fast travel you out of a dungeon once you've made it to the end. You have to fight your way back out the way you came. And every time you move from area to area within a dungeon, monsters will respawn. The game also uses random overworld sprites for monsters, so what may look like an adorable little lizard could actually be a gigantic fire-breathing dragon, or a gigantic mech, armed to the teeth. Monsters also get stronger as you do, so even the most well-prepared high-level party can still be easy pickings during certain fights. Sometimes it may even feel like the game is actively learning your playstyle, just so it can counter your strategies, like casting charm on a character that's seconds away from performing an area of effect attack and thusly wiping out your entire party in one turn. That happened to me several times. These are just standard enemies, mind you. Just be prepared. This game can actually be quite tough at the start of a storyline, but around three-fourths of the way through, things start to get easier, assuming you haven't spent the entire game running from monsters, which I'm guilty of sometimes. Just be prepared with healing spells and items prior to venturing out, and always be mindful of an escape plan. Luckily, at the end of each battle, all of your character's health is completely restored, but not their ability points. But I certainly can't complain. During my playthrough, I instantly became hooked after playing through Red's story. 
Both Red Acellus as well as T69420 easily deserve their own standalone games. All three have really well written storylines that kept me invested and engaged, and all three do a fantastic job of pulling you into their worlds. Acellus' story even has multiple endings, which is absolutely insane considering the game is basically seven games in one. If I had to pick one character to get their own standalone game, it would definitely be hers. The game did begin to drag on for me personally, beginning with Amelia's story, which just felt like kind of a mess after the opening segments. The next character I played as was Loot, who basically has no story at all. Most of it was cut for budget and time constraints like I mentioned earlier. His story does have a final boss, just like all the other ones, but that's about all he has. So his story is really just a big grind fest, just to be one guy. It was at this point in my playthrough that I realized even though I quickly fell in love with the game, I was ready for it to be over. If you're planning on completing every single character, expect this game to take a very, very long time. It's almost long just for the sake of being long. But in a way, that could be a good thing if you're a poor kid in the 90s who might only get one game a year at Christmas. Part of the problem is, despite its gigantic world, you typically end up having no choice but to repeat the same few side quests over and over with each different character. Which is really unfortunate because there is a lot of places to explore in this game, but a lot of these places, I feel, were not used to their full potential. Probably my biggest gripe was when you first start playing, you create a save file separate from your actual game save file, and each time you finish a character storyline, you overwrite that save file in order to tell the game how many characters you've completed. When creating the save file, it also asks you all kinds of weird questions, like your name, your horoscope, your blood type. I was expecting some kind of absolutely insane scenario, in which all of the characters met up to face up against some super crazy, super duper mega ultimate final boss. Or maybe even just a secret hidden storyline. Instead, for 120 hours of playing, you just get to go to a dev room and read messages from the game's developers. Instead, for 120 hours worth of playing, you just get to go to a dev room and read messages from the game's developers. Which is cool, don't get me wrong, but I was expecting a little more than that. That being said, these are small things to take issues with. Overall, Saga Frontier is an absolutely amazing game that I feel is overlooked by a lot of people. Just be forewarned that you're going to be in for one long journey if you decide to play. I don't know why, but I've always wanted to play a sci-fi JRPG that took place on multiple planets and involved space travel. And yes, I've tried Star Ocean. Each location you visit in the game is referred to as a region, and you have to take a ship to travel to each different region. The ships clearly look like spaceships, but they don't appear to be flying through space. But they also don't seem to be flying in the air either. There really isn't any in-game explanation for this at all. It's essentially up to the player's interpretation, which is the beauty of games from this era. Saga Frontier, in a way, captures all of the little pieces of what it was like to be a kid in the 90s. It has giant robots, possibly space pirates, classic 90s anime tropes from series like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and Outlaw Star, and so much more, all packed into one massive, unforgettable JRPG experience. And so with its satisfying combat, massive worlds to explore, and all of its lighthearted, goofy content, I absolutely recommend you play Saga Frontier. Thank you guys for watching, drop a like, subscribe maybe, and I'll see you in the next one.